Hello, boys and girls of Credit Union Land, and welcome to episode 23 of the CU Insight Experience. My name is Randy Smith. I am one of the co-founders and the publisher of CUinsight.com, and it is my job on the show to have conversations with the best and the brightest from around the credit union community, and sometimes outside of credit unions, which this episode happens to be one of. I get to pick their brains and see if we can't all find a few nuggets that we can learn from. On today's show, I have Miss Jean Bliss. She is the founder and president of Custom Bliss and also the co-founder of the Customer Experience Professional Association. I I had a few minutes to sit down with Jean while in Miami Beach at Co-op Think this year before she took the stage as one of their keynotes. And I'll tell you what, it was a fun conversation to have. Jean is one of the foremost experts on customer-centric leadership and the role of the chief customer officer. She's a consultant and a thought leader. She guides the C-suite, C-suites all over the world, towards earning the right business growth and prosperity by improving customer lives. Our entire conversation, I just kept thinking she should be working in credit unions all the time. Jean is an author. We talked about her new book, which was also the title of her keynote presentation, Would You Do That to Your Mother? I suggest picking that up. We will link to it. She has a podcast. She has blogs. uh, So much information uh, that you'll see in the links below. We talked about putting customers first. We talked the difference between coaching and consulting. And what she means by saying that a leader must personally have skin in the game. This episode was full of leadership and life hacks, and we even still wrapped it up with the rapid fire questions. This was a lot of fun to record. I wish I could have had more time with her, but she has a lot of content out there that we can all follow and consume more from. Awesome conversation. So without further ado, I give you my conversation with Miss Jean Bliss. Enjoy. Jean, thank you so much for being on the show. I was really looking forward to this. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Uh, we're, we're here in Miami Beach at yep. uh, Co-op Think. And when I saw your name as one of the keynotes, I reached out to some people I know to see if we could <laughs> get you on the podcast because I thought it would be so much fun. Uh, the, the first question, I just want to jump into it, is like not only just credit unions, and but business in general. Uh-huh. I mean, is it like redefining that customer service model, I guess I would say. That's something that you've spoken and written a lot about. Yeah. Here's the thing. Here's an easy way to think about it. Customer service is the reactive response to a problem. Customer experience is the proactive and deliberate crafting of a complete relationship with a customer. That's, I mean, really is fantastic. I, When I was watching one of your YouTube videos, mm-hmm. <laughs> so and, and we will link to... YouTube videos, your books, your, I mean, everything that you do have out there. I noticed that like it was in, in credit unions in general, we talk about being people helping people and we talk a lot about the member. And so I thought it was again, great that you were going to be here because it seemed like you talked about the, the customer experience, like not how is this good for the company necessarily, but how is it, you know, like how do you reach the customer, you know, give the customer what they're looking for first. Is that a mistake that I guess you see people making or business making, uh, you know, looking at, maybe the opposite side of that coin? Well, here's what happens. You know, it's normal for people to want to hit their key performance indicators and their goals and all of these things, which are terrific, except for what happens is they're sometimes built with an internal lens, which is around what we want to get or what we want to get done and sometimes even what we want to get from the customer. And when we rework it, the starting point is different. The starting point is the customer's life and their goals and their emotions. And then that begins our marching orders of what we build and how we build it and what we measure and what we celebrate. It's paradoxical, though, because often companies think the shortest path to getting what they need is to getting what they want, when in fact, the shortest, most sustainable path is giving customers what they need and having customers be able to say in their own words, what they've accomplished because they've worked with a certain company, the goals that they've accomplished. And it's it takes a while for that to click in, and it's still not clicking in everywhere. Is that something that when you're working with corporations, is that something that you see from that needs to like a cultural change from the top down? Or? It is a change. One of the very first things we do with leaders is something it's been in all my books I call customers as assets. And it's just very simply doing math 
we often will really focus on and celebrate incoming customers, how many we've acquired. We brought in 50 new customers, ding, ding, let's ring the bell, everybody's happy. But in the same breath, in the same sentence, we're not saying, but we lost 37. And the 37 that we lost are of higher value because some have been with us 20 years, et cetera, than the new ones we brought in. And then we're not doing the math to say, what's our net, net customer asset growth? That's the biggest flip and the, the attitude. It's an attitude shift. It's not a dashboard that we start with leaders inside of organizations. Because if you're not doing that math, your, your eyeballs and what you're considering success is on incoming but not net growth. That resonates with me as somebody who was in sales for a long time. Right. You, you, you focus so much on the new. That's right. You're forgetting about the people that got you there, that's right? That's right. So, and the uh, net. Yeah. And, 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 and the we, net overall. That's, that's right. Yeah. And even using retention rates gives you a false positive because if you're at 67%, you're not thinking about the number that you had to keep replacing if you're okay. staying steady at 67. And so I like to use whole numbers so that you think about the human. We brought in 50. We lost 34. 34 human beings decided to walk away from us. That's very interesting. I, I was wondering where when you said not even the re- Tension rate would be a, a good measure. That's right. That completely makes sense to me. Uh, your latest book. Uh huh. Would you uh, do that to your mother? I, you know, one of the things that you <laughs> talked a lot about in there, and I, it seemed again to, that it should resonate a lot with mm-hmm. credit unions and right. the people helping people side was, you know, this idea of making business personal. Right. Um, and we're like at this conference, there's been a ton of talk about digitalization mm-hmm. and all these other things, but it's still it, like it comes back to the human, right? It, like it in does. That, that interaction. So could you expand on that a little yeah, bit more? Yeah, of course. What's happened is whenever something gets very popular, customer experience is very popular right now, we get very good at the mechanics of it, touch point mapping, journey mapping, voice of customer. But what happens is we lose the meaning in the mechanics And the meaning of all of our work at the end of the day, especially credit unions, right, is improving a life. And so much of the work has got to be about leadership and leadership bravery and choosing what you will and will not do. And also then if your goal is to really know a customer, it's not about AI. It's about honoring them by knowing them. But yet we inadvertently focus on the mechanic of AI versus the meaning, which is to honor the customer by knowing who they are and delivering relevant information. And that's where the flip needs to be. And that's why I wrote this fourth book, because I I wanted us to get back to the reason we're doing this stuff in the first place. I will tell you that I I ordered it, so I cannot wait to read it. I I just found out we're going to be able to have this conversation. Oh, fantastic. I I would have loved to before, but I'm looking forward to it. I was reading the blurbs and even some of the reviews, so I'm very much so. Is there something that uh, like credit unions should do today to have the greatest impact? Take that first step forward. Well, there's a number of things. So the way the book is organized, if you want to think about it from that standpoint, the first is around really, I call it enabling your employees to thrive. Um, In the book, it's called Be the Person I Raised You to Be. But what we're inadvertently doing is penning our people into a set of rules and policies and procedures when, in fact, if we're hiring them for the right reason, we can work with them to identify the five or 10 reasons why customers need exceptions because there are, you can sit down and count on your hands the reasons and then be deliberate and proactive in saying, okay, here are the choices you can make without asking permission. You make the call. And it doesn't take that much work, but instead we're in this, we're still in a little bit of a command mode where you've got a manager and a manager has a manager and we shoot it up the chain of command when in fact, If we think proactively, we can raise people's spirits by involving them and identifying those things, giving them choice, and then trusting them to make the call. So in a bigger organization or maybe, I mean, maybe any organization, maybe I shouldn't qualify that. Do you put limitations on that or is it just, I mean, on the, or is it? Well, you have to think it through. One of the case studies that I talk about um, that I'll be talking about on stage in a little while is Alaska Airlines. And what they've done is built what I've dubbed as the We Trust You Toolkit. So it's an app. Again, it's the intersection of high tech and high touch. Yeah. Right. Wow. Um, Where they've identified 10 different action items that they can do, give you miles, give you an extra drink, rebook your thing, get you a hotel room. But everybody, their CEO says first, I want you to connect with the human and you decide what what is warranted. And then you choose one of these things. But again, it's honoring the integrity of the employee that you hired for their values and then giving them the trust 
to make the right call. It's not throwing away profits willy nilly. Yeah, no. Because we lose customers in the moments where we're doing the handoff, and we lose employees because we diminish their spirit by forcing them to continue touch the desk, touch the desk, touch the desk. That makes a lot of sense, and I, you would I would think also just that like to use the Alaska Airlines example. The person in the moment knows what's going to resonate that's the most exactly, with the individual, that's right? That's exactly so. right because – I get it. We have to create some random you know, road rules and regulations and all of these things to guide us. But in the moment, they're, they don't all fit right. in the moment. And they also – you know, one of the things is would you turn down your mom's warranty claim three days out of warranty? Well – no. <laughs> and if you're a frontline person, you'd want to be given the opportunity to see the value of your mom, to understand what your mom's situation is, and then be honored to make the call. I think that's, I think one of my favorite words is empathy. So, you know, instead of putting yourself in those shoes, if you're putting your mom in that, if that's your mom. Well, and then you... be deliberate. <laughs> you know, empathy is great. But if we say be empathetic without first thinking through and giving people permission and choices for how they can, then it's something you're etching on a crystal ball. Absolutely. It's not that, part of your operating plan. That, so you can operationalize empathy. I, I absolutely love that. I, that's, uh, I'm really looking forward to your book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so when I was, uh, you know, scouring the interwebs, trying to, uh, you know, just do some research to, sure. you know, as, to have this conversation, I noticed something over and over. You call yourself a coach, not a consultant. I am a coach. It, Tell me why that's important and why – I would love to know how do you think somebody should find a coach? If credit unions are looking for that that coach sure. instead, of a, instead of a consultant. Well, I was a practitioner for 25 years before I started doing this work and that always will put me in the shoes of the person doing the work. Yep. Um, a coach for me and the way I'm defining it is someone – my goal is to emancipate you from me as fast as I can. My goal is to teach you to fish because leading this work has to be led from within the organization. We've seen lots and lots of examples where really – and I have nothing negative at all. But when you roll out consultants and they're pitching decks and doing other things, but it's not internalized by the leaders of the organization, it's not sustainable. It's an effort with a point in time. And the work for it to really be about – how the company will grow and just as much now how it won't grow has to be led and grown by the leaders. And so we, we get, we give the C-suite assignments, everyone's involved. Um, you know, so it's really, and, and again, I don't need you to be tethered to me forevermore. You know, lots of my clients will come back a year or two later, but that's not my goal. It's is not to tether. It's to emancipate, which is kind of uncommon. That's yeah. You're not trying to to get the next consulting fee. I think that plays in perfectly to the, one of the things that I also noticed in something I was watching of yours that you said leaders have to have skin in the game. Yep. What do you mean by that? Well, one of the things that we do often, I call it experiential listening, is if you have your leaders do everything you require a customer to do. Go try to open account, try to close account, try to do a withdrawal, try to get a loan, try to do everything, try to download something, try to call your numbers. That's one way. The other, though, is this is really about behaviors. It's leaders personally taking actions that show that this is real. For example, find something that has bugged your employees or customers for a long time and commit to getting rid of it and then moving forward with other things because Leaders have to be part of the work often, and not always, we hire a chief customer officer or someone and then we relegate it to them or delegate it to them, but that is not the work. The work is they're a part of it. They're a part of insisting how things are reported. They're a part of saying, no, you didn't start with the customer. So it needs to be their mission along with whoever else is helping to lead it inside the organization and a united leadership team, even more importantly, because every part of the leadership team will come together. I call it um, situational commitment. Will come together, but then they disband and go back off into their own operating areas and keep saying the same things they've always said. So there is a lot of behavior modification that has to occur. Uh, that's what I was just going to say. That sounds like it because it's, uh, yeah, when somebody walks out of the boardroom, having them, I mean, everybody buy in basically. That's right. It's well, and that's why it's so many people, when, when I do the coaching, the first thing we're doing is uniting the C-suite. We're getting everybody on the same page, not only with what the work is, but what I call the beginning version of the truth. What is the true 
experience you're giving your customers today because everybody's sliding in from their silo and everybody's working hard. And so, of course, from their point of view, they're doing well. But from the customer's holistic point of view across your company, they've got a different view of how you're doing. So we need to level set and kind of talk about reliability across the channels, across the people, across the products, across the different retail locations. And that's the beginning. And sometimes it's a little hard to see, but we, what the way I do it is we put leaders through, I, I call it the Vulcan mind melt. <laughs> but we put, they talk to customers, we have the customers rate the stages of the journey. And then over the time, it becomes, oh, we get it. This is what we need to do because it has to be their idea. It has to come from them and they have to feel like they're really driving it. That they're the, the driver behind That's it. That's right. They're the one who's going to have to implement That's right. It, right? You can't so. call their baby ugly. They right. have to be the ones to do it themselves. <laughs> Let them figure that out. Huh? That's right. Uh, that's, I, the, that's the magic in the work. That's, that's the art with the science. Right there. Uh, I'd like to move in. Uh, on every podcast, we, we talk, tend to talk to leaders. Uh, so I like to ask a few kind of leadership and life hack questions sure. that you could share with other leaders or young leaders that are coming up because it's all something we have to go through. So, and there's a, just a ton of scratch my own itch questions in here. So like, how did you get into doing what you're doing? How did you become a coach? Well, I, I, as I mentioned, I was a practitioner first. I had the great um, opportunity and joy of reporting to the CEOs of a lot of big organizations. My first job was at Land's End okay. um, yeah. in Wisconsin in 1983. I was first brought in to train 2,500 phone operators. But over time, I started peppering Gary Comer, the founder, with a lot of questions. He took me off the phones and called me the conscience of the company, and I reported to the executive committee. It was the first version of a chief customer officer role. And then I went on and deliberately moved industry to industry. I moved to my Mazda Motor of America, reported to the senior American there. I went to Coldwell Banker, wanted to do B2B, and I was the senior vice president of franchise services. I uh, then wanted to go larger, so I went to Allstate. I was the first vice president of customer satisfaction and retention at Allstate, and then knew I needed technology, so I was the first general manager of worldwide customer and partner loyalty at Microsoft. Yep. That's, we've, so, I think we've heard of most of those companies. Yeah, so, so um, <laughs> I, got, I felt like I had earned my stripes yeah. in terms of being a practitioner because there's a lot of people out there, again, good, good people, but if you haven't done the work, yep. so much of the work is the underbelly work. It's the culture and leaders and uniting the organization. It's not just the mechanics. You know, it's interesting you bring that up. So many of the leaders that have been on the podcast that now are what I would say in more industry type events, leading companies mm -hmm. and things like that, they have went back to that time they worked in the credit union. And they're always mm -hmm. just like, you had to have the kind of the boots yeah. on the ground. That's right. How did that feel? How did it feel as the member? You talked about calling into the call centers and you know, right. making sure that it all works. That's so. exactly right. Question I love to ask, has the motivation changed for you? And like, how do you keep yourself? You seem like you have a lot of energy. So how do you I, keep yourself up every day? It is interesting. <laughs> I've been doing it for 35 years. And what's interesting is actually a little more than that now, but it's been very energizing as I've moved from doing the work to now coaching and enabling others to do the work. And that's joy every single day. So it's been fantastic. That's a beautiful thing. When you look back to earlier in your career and while you're coaching, is there a, a mistake that either you made or you see young leaders make over and over again? Well, one of the biggest things I, I did this when I was doing the work is that you inadvertently misunderstand that this work isn't about you. It's about shining a light on others and being the duct tape of the organization. And so one of the biggest things I have to coach people is you need to check your ego and your silo at the door. And often if, you know, someone's a chief customer officer or the people I coach, we have them try to report to a Switzerland area, you know, like the CEO where there is no silo alignment so that you can really unite the organization. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense though. Wow. Has there been a piece of advice that you received over life that you find yourself going back to over and over again? The interesting thing for me was uh, being my authentic self, which is jargony. The way I prefer to say it is when I was at Land's End a million years ago, we were doing everything. We were $100 million in sales when I joined and over a billion dollars when I left about 10 years later. And so we were... I was not only training the phone operators and doing these other things, but we were writing copy when we had to write copy for the catalog. And I was writing this, what I thought was very good copy. And it, Gary Comer looked at it and it's, he's like, what are all these corporate -y words? He said, write like you talk. It changed 
everything for me. You know, I'm a Catholic Italian girl from Chicago. You can hear it in my voice. You'll see it when I'm on stage. The way I write is, you know, it's like the, the very first book I wrote, the first sentence is, here's the deal about this book. Here's the deal. So it's just being very real and human, and I, it's, it served me well. I love it. I'm a Midwestern girl. Yeah. I'm originally from Detroit. So. Well, there you go. It's, yeah, we, uh, we all have some kind of corn or potatoes in our mind. That's right. That's exactly it. If you have a free day, there's nothing on the calendar. What do you do to recharge? What does work-life balance look like for you? Um, my husband and I, we get up, we watch a movie, we walk three or four miles, we cook, we go out to dinner, you know, normal stuff. Normal stuff. It's not very exciting. <laughs> Mostly uh, being with each other. That's well. That's fantastic. Uh, the, the last part. I want to be respectful of your time, so we've got some rapid fire questions that okay. I ask everybody. Questions are rapid. Your answers don't have to be. Okay. Um, first one. Do you remember the first time you got in memorable trouble that you'll share with us? Um, I I don't remember. Uh, not a story from back in the uh, yeah. with all the brothers and sisters. Yeah, there's a lot. There was a lot of them. I mean, I I, I do remember. We, I actually talk about getting your mouth washed out with soap. I do remember getting my my, my mouth washed out with soap for doing. I don't remember what I did. What but you did, I but do you remember, remember the, the punishment. Soap. Yeah, I remember the soap. <laughs> that, that that may have happened in my house too. So, do you have any daily routines that if you don't do, you just feel off? I mean, to give an example, I journal every morning before I look at everything on the socials and email and everything like that. Just to dump all this stuff yeah. out of my head. Is there anything that you do that you just have to do every day? I work out every day. Okay. I do a gratitude thing every day. And I um, try to sit in silence every day. Uh, that's a struggle for me, but I also try to do that as well. The, the gratitude thing, do you, is that something you write down? Or is no, it something you just pause, I, take a time I and reflect? I just constantly, it's interesting because if something is starting to boil up, I'll just say, you are you have so much to be grateful for. And then it like, it immediately salves, takes a little edge off. Yeah. And then I just, you know, the rest, it flows. I was reading a, a book on gratitude once and uh, the woman said, <clears throat> I'm like, even if you're in the supermarket, pick up the avocado and just think how many hands touch that, <laughs> you know, and like, you're here to buy it at Whole Foods, <laughs> and then not, Purell not yourself. picking it. And then, yeah, get the Burrell out. So. <laughs> The the random question. We're going to okay. put together a playlist at the end of the year. What's the best album of all time? The one you can listen to from front to back? Uh, probably Beatles' White Album. Uh, that's a, that is a good one. We don't have to go deeper than that. Uh, I'm a reader. Besides your book, which I've already ordered, uh, is there a book that over the course of your career you've recommended to others or gifted to others that you think everybody should read? Um, you know, I, I like the Dale Carnegie books still. I think they're um, still great books. I like... Um, there's another book. I can't remember the name of it. Like, As you've gotten older, what's become more important to you? And I, almost more importantly, how about what's become less important? Uh, time with people that I care about and saying no. This has become more important? Yeah. Yeah. That seems to be one of those things that comes with age, right? Like you have to say no to say yes to yep. the things you want to do in life. So this is a, a question that I didn't send over and I, I don't send it to everybody, anybody in advance. But when you hear the word success, who's the first person that pops into your head? My dad. <laughs> Why? He, I, I actually uh, talk about my dad a lot. He was, I learned about humanity and business by watching my dad and his Buster Brown shoe store. In Des Plaines, Illinois. He had one little shoe store and seven kids, so do the math. Yeah. It, it, it was wasn't, a lot of shoes. It, well, no, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> what I mean was it wasn't prosperity of riches. It was prosperity of the human spirit. It was he shooed a generation of children and their children's children. And when he retired, a line of people three blocks long stood to say goodbye to this man. Oh, that's beautiful. You know, that buying shoes would never be the same. And, in fact, it's inspired – a big thing that I talk about on my new website coming up, which is what's your three blocks long? How do you want to be remembered? Wow. Okay. That's fantastic. So I see why it's your dad. And uh, I think all the dads out there that listen will be excited to hear that because mom gets answered a lot. <laughs> so oh, yeah. I think you might be the first answer dad in the 20 some episodes we've been doing this. Even now. though so, I wrote a mom book. You wrote a mom book, right? So I was, I, I'm glad I didn't make assumptions and think who it would be for you. So I, I'd like to thank you again. It, this is the last question I have for you because like I said, I want to be respectful of your time and you've got a big presentation to give. Do you have any final thoughts for our listeners or an ask that you'd like to throw out there to them? You know, I think that one of the things that happens as I talk to people is only keep doing the work while you're passionate about it. 
if the steam has run out of it and it's not your balloon anymore, don't do it because everybody around you is going to feel it. Find another way to take your gifts and apply them. I, I love that line. Take your gifts. Uh, well, thank you so much again. If people have uh, questions of you, is uh, Twitter a great way to get a hold of you? I saw you're on there. How do you how do you I'm prefer on to Twitter, be contacted? But just email me. It's Jean uh, J E A N N E at customerbliss.com. I married a guy named Bliss. So, you know, how lucky is that? Uh, what a perfect name for yeah, a coach, right? Yeah, I tell so. people I went all over match.com to find him. <laughs> to, to, just to find true. him. What's your last name? So, yeah, well, thank right. you again, Gene. You're I welcome. greatly appreciate it. Good luck on your presentation thank today. You. And uh, we hope everybody has a great day. Thank you. 